Okay, I'll just go right ahead and get started. Um, a few years back, I read a book by Neil Gunther, who's a man of towering genius, and uh, and, and that's really no exaggeration. He is. Uh, I also had dinner with him a couple of months ago, and, uh, and he knocked my socks off again. Um, and that sort of began the genesis for a lot of this work that I've done, learning a little bit here and there, little patches about uh, mathematical analysis of performance and scalability. And um, so what I'm going to do is kind of take you on a whirlwind tour of all of that, as well as show you some extremely practical things. I'm not going to go a lot into theory. I'll show you some equations, but I'm not going to ask you to do any math, and the equations actually turn out to be relatively simple. What I'm really going to focus on today is, is really practical stuff that you can just do and, um, and get good results from. So this, this talk is divided up into two parts. The first part, I'm going to look at how we can find out things about a system basically without knowing anything about it. That's why I call it black box performance analysis. You can capture some TCP headers from the system, and, uh, and you can learn it tremendous amount about the performance of the underlying systems, whatever they are. And, um, and all of this with very, very little effort. So I, I say this, you may not really, uh, you may not be, uh, you may not have been involved in any big performance analysis projects, but a lot of them can be very big indeed. They can be multiple, multiple month kind of things. And uh, those sorts of large budget, large effort kinds of things can be started without really knowing what's going to come out on the other end or, or knowing whether there's anything to be learned or gained by doing this. Uh, in contrast, this is, a, this is a technique that you can use to poke into systems um, with basically no budget and no time and no effort and see whether it merits deeper investigation. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk a little bit about forecasting performance and scalability so we can figure out how the server is going to perform to some extent out beyond what we can observe. And this is, of course, the perennial question that everybody wants to know. You know, what's, what's my system going to behave like during Christmas this year, assuming that I have this much traffic? Am I going to be able to handle that? I've never had that much traffic before. So that kind of thing we can, we can look into. So uh, all of this is based on just TCP IP packet headers. Not the, not the full TCP IP data itself, not the payload of the packets, just the headers. And if you know your, your TCP and your IP protocols, um, that's the first 384 bytes of each packet. Uh, the TCP uh, headers contain the port number, the, the TCP port that the packet is destined to, and the IP headers contain the IP address. So the combination of those two things gives you uh, really the markers that we need. Um, and then the other little bit of information that we need comes from the timestamp that the packet arrives or departs from the system. So, so those sort of, those are, are what I call the, the fundamental metrics of, of performance because you can derive so much else from them. So TCP is, is great because uh, lots and lots of things talk TCP to each other. And uh, you can grab the packet headers very easily. It's a very lightweight process. Um, you can get them from the client server. You can get from the database server. You can get them from somewhere in between on a port span or something like that. And uh, if you can't get them, you can ask someone else to get them for you. And it's often, uh, it's, there's really, uh, in a lot of cases, you may not have, or in some cases, I may not have access to what's considered privileged data. But IP addresses and port numbers are typically not considered to be privileged data. So this becomes uh, almost no red tape kind of an, an exercise. So we, uh, to, to sum up this slide, we get the destination and origin ports and uh, IP addresses, and we get the timestamp. And that's all we really need to know to do a, a whole ton of interesting analysis of the systems. So from these, we get the arrival and completion time and the session identifier. Now, the session identifier, let's suppose that we have a client that is a web application or something like that that's talking to your MySQL server. The MySQL server is on a fixed known IP address, and it's listening on a fixed known port, normally port 3306. The client is on uh, an IP address that might you know, be one of many application servers, and the connection that it makes to the port 3306 on the database server um, comes from a port that is determined at the time that the TCP connection is originated. So, uh, but that's unique because that's the same port that the MySQL server is going to send back to. 
So what we're really, the session identifier is really the IP address and the port number of the origination of the request. And we can use that to tie together the packet that travels from a client to the server and then the client server uh, in, in reverse. And we can use that, that combination of IP address and port number to, to create sort of a session identifier there. Um, and again, just by using TCP dump, nice open source software that runs on pretty much every platform, even there's, there's even a wind dump for, for Windows, uh, we can get the arrival and completion timestamps. And the timestamps are high resolution. They will be shown in microsecond resolution. The real fidelity of that measurement is somewhat less, um, but certainly in normally in sub-millisecond granularity. Um, the, there, there are some differences about when things arrive in the buffers and when they actually get delivered to the application and all of those kinds of things. So you can't 100% trust the timestamps down to the microsecond, but um, you, you, you do get that output granularity from TCP dump itself. So we can use these metrics, these um, arrival and completion timestamps in the session identifier to construct conversations back and forth where we consider each packet that comes to the server to be the beginning of a request and each packet that returns the other direction to be the termination of the request. And there are a few subtleties about how we can do this and the tools that I'll show you allow you to um, select different um, options if you want but by default. What I do is I consider that the first inbound packet uh, I'm sorry, the last inbound packet from, from a client terminates the, the request. At this point, the server has the request and I consider it to begin working on it. And then uh, the first outbound packet usually indicates that the server is complete with the query. Um, and so, so what I do is I subtract the two of those. So from that, we get the total execution time and we can uh, then chop these, gather a whole bunch of these things and chop them up into intervals of time and aggregate them together. And over those, we can derive a whole bunch of metrics, which are up on the screen here. So, of course, we can get queries for, per second just by counting the number of, uh, uh, the number of responses and, and requests that complete during that time. We can get the busy time or utilization, which is um, a, the portion of time during which at least one request is resident in the server that is in progress on the server. We can get the total execution time by adding them all up together. And then we can do, um, via Little's Law, we can get uh, average concurrency, average response time, utilization, all of these kinds of things. So this is, this is uh, your uh, TCB dump command to capture these packet headers from the system. Um, I'll just read off what these arguments do. Some of you will know this, but uh, some of you may not be familiar with TCB dump. The dash S384 is the snap size or the, the amount of uh, data that we're going to capture from each packet. 384 bytes is the packet headers, as I said. Now, sometimes I'll actually capture more data than this, um, but in a lot of cases, I'll just grab the 384 bytes. That's all that we really, really need for the, for the analysis that I'll show you. Dash I, any means listen on any interface, any network interface on the box. Um, some other systems you might need to specifically tell the uh, TCP dump which interface, whether it's E0, N0, or whatever it is. Um, dash NNQ means don't resolve host names and don't resolve host names again. So there's, you, you specify that flag twice, and then you specify Q for quiet so that you suppress some of the noise. Uh, and the four T's are timestamp formatting. So if you give the dash T four times, you'll get this uh, uh, timestamp formatted down to the microsecond. And then this complicated expression in the single quotes actually comes from the TCP dump manual page. It basically says, listen on port 3306, which is MySQL's port, and throw away everything that isn't actually carrying a, a payload at the higher levels in the protocol. Throw away things like the TCP ACK and SYN and the, the handshake and all of those kinds of things. We'll just ignore those because those represent TCP um, communications, but not MySQL communications. Okay, so we're just discarding all of that stuff. And then I'm going to output the result into TCP file.txt. Now, sometimes I will find that um, a bunch of packets will be dropped. And so, so instead of formatting things with the dash nnq and the dash tttt and all of those kinds of things and, and outputting it into a text file, I'll actually just skip those arguments and uh, use the dash w option to write it to a, a binary file, a packet capture file, which I can then use TCP dump to read back in later. And that sometimes helps to avoid dropped packets. And when we get, um, I thought I should get it, there we go, there's the sample. 
OK, I just mentioned that. So here's a sample of the data. And uh, this is kind of small to see from the back of the room. But basically, each line in the output represents one packet. And uh, we can see here that we've got a, a packet originating. This is the timestamp. The, the first three fields here, or, or two fields here, are the timestamp. Then it says IP, which is just, it's always going to say IP. And then you have the origination um, IP address and port. And then the destination IP address and port. So you can see in this case, we're going to, to the MySQL server. And then this thing at the end of the line says how many bytes were in the full packet. But we didn't capture that. We only captured the headers, not the full packet. Um, so we'll ignore that from now on. So we have this first line is coming from port 56520 to the MySQL server. And then in the line underneath, we see MySQL server responding back to port 56520. So that represents an inbound and an outbound packet. And we can subtract the timestamps there. So we have you know, whatever these timestamp differences are, uh, 238 milliseconds, uh, microseconds, if I'm correct. Um, so I think I, I have this larger in case you can't really see it in the back of the room. Uh, but I think uh, I probably narrated that well enough. <clears throat> so what we do, I, I have a tool in, that's part of Percona Toolkit, free, open source, like all the rest of the Percona Toolkit tools. What we do is, is rip through this file and correlate these inbound and outbound packets. And the, the tool is called PTTCP model. And you can just slurp in the TCP file that, uh, that we see at the top of the screen and redirect it out into this file called requests. And I've added some, some uh, headers on this just to make it clear what the columns are. But those headers aren't in the real data. I've just done that for illustration purposes only. And what we get is, um, on the left-hand side, we have a sequence number in arrival order. So this is the order that the tool sees these requests arriving. And then we have a start and end timestamp, the difference between them. So you have 238 microseconds. And then the host and port of the, uh, of the client that sent the request to the server. So now what we've done is we've collapsed two lines into one line. And this makes it easier for us to use Unix tools to process this data. Uh, so I like, I like data that's one line. Um, per, uh, per record or per row or whatever you want to call it so that we can process it with standard Unix tools and uh, that allows us to skip spreadsheets because spreadsheets on large amounts of data like this are a nightmare. So now we've got this and uh, we can do interesting things with it. Um, so just to, just to tie all this together, this is the same arrival and departure timestamps that we saw before but now it's converted to a Unix timestamp format instead of being formatted as a, um, uh, an ISO 8601 or whatever that formatting standard is. And then the, the difference here, 238. And then this is the port 56520 that we saw from that application. I'm using a single sample of TCP data. Uh, and there's a white paper on Percona.com that kind of walks through everything that I'm talking about here today, as well as has a link to this data. So you can download this exact data and run these tools on it and repeat my results. And you can use that as kind of a tutorial if you want to teach yourself and make sure that you can reproduce what I've done. So the, the, the next thing that I'm going to do with this is do some black box performance analysis on this sample of data, which is from a, a Ruby on Rails application. Um, so the, I, I grabbed a few samples. This was during several different load, uh, uh, several different levels of load on the application. And um, I grabbed some that were short and some that were long. You don't really need a lot of data here to kind of see these things pull out of, of the data. And uh, this, is, this is one of our customers. Um, I've done this analysis for them several times. So this was on a new server that they had moved out of the cloud. If you look at some of my older presentations, white papers, blog posts, you'll see similar analysis done in the cloud. And you can see some differences, but you can also see the characteristic kind of signature of the application remains the same. <laughs> So it is a Ruby on Rails application. It's an e-commerce website. And um, they have some other things like batch jobs and um, cash pre-warming and analysis kinds of things going on in the background, too. And we'll kind of see some of those things popping out in the data as we go. So step one for me is always to just plot on a time series graph. And I use GNU plot. You can use R. You can use, I, I know there are some graphing applications for different platforms like the Mac that make this really easy. The key thing is not to use a spreadsheet. Um, spreadsheets tend to completely choke and make things really, really awkward. I use GNU plot because you can just tell it to, um, every line that it reads in from that file that we output earlier, it breaks up into space delimited words and treats them as columns. And you can just say plot dollar one. 
and it'll plot the first column. Um, and so it, it's extremely easy. They're, they're just little one-liners. You can, you can get started in a few seconds, and it's also very high performance. So if I just plot one of those samples, I think the sample that I'm using to generate this plot is about 17 seconds long. So time goes from left to right. And response time, um, I'm, I'm plotting the, uh, I think it's the fourth field. Yeah, the fourth field. I'm, I'm plotting the uh, elapsed field, the uh, column here, which is the response time of these requests, the difference between the, the inbound and the outbound packets. So that's the, the vertical axis. So we can see most of these things are clustered down around the, the, uh, down around the x axis. Uh, they're very close to zero, so we have this solid blue bar kind of coming across the bottom. And then we have these interesting little spikes that are going vertically up the screen. But then there's another pattern here that comes out real quickly, which is it's somewhere up around here, around the two-thirds of a second range or something like that. There appear to be a bunch of requests that are much slower than the normal request for some reason. Um, anybody want to guess what's happening on this system? So contention or waiting for locks? There was a hand in the back here. OK. So good guesses. Um, there's a couple of different things. The vertical spikes are uh, waiting for locks, as someone guessed. The horizontal spikes, or the, the horizontal line, is just some particular kind of query that consistently seems to run longer than the rest. And I actually, on this, uh, on this analysis, I gathered the full packet payload so that I could peek into the um, peek into this and see what was really going on. Um, if I had only gathered the, the packet headers, I wouldn't have been able to do that. But in this particular example, I did gather the full payload. And then I used um, PT Query Digest tool, which understands TCP dump. Uh, actually, it understands the MySQL TCP protocol. So I was able to pull the queries out of it and kind of see what they were doing. So what's happening in these vertical spikes, if you'll notice, they're slightly tilted. That's not an optical illusion. They actually are, they're not completely vertical, but they're tilted a little bit this way. And the reason for that is because I've plotted these things in completion time order. Now, the way that the, that the tool actually outputs things is that um, it sees an inbound packet and it goes, OK. I'll just remember that for a second. And then when it sees the outbound packet, it goes, ah, that's the response to the inbound packet. I'm going to print out a line now. And so it's printing out a line every time it gets the response. That means the completion of the query determines when the lines are printed out. And if I just plot this on the, uh, uh, plot the results of that file, I'm plotting things in completion time order. Now, completion time is a fantastic tool for analyzing bo bottlenecks and, and dependencies between events in a system. Because if something is holding a resource, what happens is everything else that requires access to that resource piles up against it. And when the first thing completes, then the others go ahead and complete, 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 complete as well. And that's why we get this slanted line. Because what's really happening here is, let's take this one. A one second long request was holding some, some resource, a lock. And then just after it completed, uh, what is this, maybe a tenth of a second here? A tenth of a second later, the second one completed. It had been kind of given the go-ahead to, to go ahead and do its work. And then maybe two or three tenths of a second later, we had this one and so forth and so on. And you can kind of see everybody else kind of flushing through the system. The log jam cleared and they all flushed through the system. Uh, but they do so slightly after each other because each of them is, is bottlenecking on the one before it and required to, to wait until it gets access to the resource that it was requesting. So this is indeed a select for update. <laughs> Actually, um, they've got a queue in their database. They're treating the, the table as a queue of jobs to be processed. And there's a process that goes through and claims things with select for update. And this comes from Ruby on Rails. Uh, there's a dot lock operation with the uh, active record. And that ends up what happens here is that uh, you get a select for update. So um, I'd forgotten that I'd drawn those on the, on the diagram. And I just explained this, but here's a visual diagram of kind of how that happens and why you get this, this sloping line to the right. So the stalls are, um, I, I peeked into the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the packet and, and verified that there were select for update. Now, I knew this through former uh, analysis runs on this particular database, but I did go ahead and verify that again. So if select for update causes dependencies that are based on completions of queries, completions of events, then maybe we can look at something else with completions, or we can compare completions and arrivals. 
um, and see some other interesting things coming out of the system. Now, the reason that I like to plot is because your eyes are extremely sophisticated pattern detection machines. Um, there's actually a huge amount of processing that goes on in your eye and in your optic nerve before it even gets to your brain. So as humans, we are, we're able to absorb and understand a lot of information visually that we'd otherwise have a really, really hard time uh, uh, getting out of the data. If we went back to our original, the, the contents of the text file and just kind of scrolled through that, you'd never get any meaning out of that. Um, you would feel like the guy in the matrix looking for the lady in the red dress or the, you know, the brunette and the blonde and all those kinds of things, but trust me, you wouldn't see it. So all meaning has a pattern, uh, but not all pattern has a meaning. And so when we look at this visually, our pattern matching algorithms in our eyes start to fire off and go, hmm, is there something in there to look at? And maybe there is, maybe there's not. Um, a lot of times you can look at clouds and see donkeys and pigs and kinds of things in the clouds, but there aren't really donkeys and pigs in the clouds. It's just your, your brain telling you that there's a shape there that looks like that. This plot is slightly different from the, the ones that I showed you previously. Um, what I've done is instead of showing response time on the vertical axis, I've counted the number of arrivals and the number of completions per five millisecond time slice. And the same tool, PTTCP model, can take in the, the, um, the, the, uh, the file that I showed you earlier and slice it into little chunks and then give you statistics over those chunks, things like standard deviations and percentiles and all of that kind of thing. But the simplest thing is just how many were there. And so what I've done, each point on this plot is uh, the number of response, uh, the number of um, arrivals or completions during this time slot. So for example, we've got one little time slot where it looks like about 30 things completed in a five millisecond bucket of time, but more often we're down around the five, 10, 15 range, right? But you can't really compare these things. I, I thought that arrivals and completions compared to each other might be interesting somehow, and we might learn something from the system. But what I learned from doing this is you can't really compare this. Um, so a lot of times, if you don't see a pattern in something, you're looking at something that, uh, you know, maybe you're not looking at it the right way, for example. But there's a, an, a sophisticated mathematical algorithm that can pull some more signal out of this noise. It's called subtraction. <laughs> and if we subtract the completions from the arrivals, um, or sorry, I said that wrong, subtract arrivals from, from completions, then we start to see the differences between them very clearly. And uh, we start to see what looks like an EKG plot or something like that. Typically, there will be you know, 0, 1, 2 kind of differences from, um, from interval to interval. Uh, but occasionally, every now and then, it looks like we're getting a big spike. So in some of these intervals, uh, these, and, and here I've changed the granularity to 200 milliseconds for reasons that I explain in the white paper. Um, but in each of these intervals, um, we see that sometimes there, the, the line drops down and then it goes high. So it, it drops below zero and then it goes up. And what that really means is that we had a whole bunch of things that were arriving but not completing. And then in the next time interval, we had a whole bunch of things that went ahead and completed. So you start to see this very characteristic pattern. And this is a great way to determine, in addition with the kinds of things like the spikes that I showed you on the previous graph, it's a great way to determine whether things are getting bottlenecked inside the server. Now, there are lots of things that you could do, like plotting the, uh, the graph of throughput, and you wouldn't necessarily be able to answer the question, did that happen inside the server or outside the server? Let's suppose that your application servers had a sudden burst of activity, and they sent a lot, a lot of queries um, to the server. You would see a spike in your graph, but you wouldn't know whether the spike was caused by something inside the server bottlenecking or whether it was just the application server is getting really busy for some reason. So this is one way that you can tell whether there's a stall inside your server by looking at, at the difference between the boundaries of, of um, the flow of data through the system. And those boundaries are the incoming and the outgoing requests. So here's, um, I, I plotted in, just to kind of illustrate this along the bottom, I've plotted the arrivals and the completions, again, time moving left to right. Uh, and then I've plotted the difference between them. And you can, you can see very clearly that there's a spike in this graph on the right, but you can't really visually compare the ones on the left. And in fact, even if you overlay them on top of each other and make one of the lines blue and one of the lines red, most of the time, one of those lines is going to obscure the other, and you're really not going to see. Um, even when there's a big spike in the, in the graph on the far right-hand side, you typically will not be able to see that very clearly in a plot with one of the things overlaid on top of the other. So the subtraction makes all the difference. 
There's another way that I like to detect whether something is kind of going wrong inside of a system, and that is to look at how consistent its performance is. So this is one of our big focuses, not just me, but at Perconi in general, is making things perform well, but perform well all the time. It's not enough for something to perform well on average or to perform well most of the time, and then occasionally you have really bad performance. Uh, I want it to be consistent, stable, predictable. And by slicing things into small time buckets and doing a, uh, a statistical calculation over the, um, over the requests that are in that time bucket, I can get out a metric of how variable the performance within that time bucket is. And this is called the variance to mean ratio, or um, it's also called the index of dispersion. And there are other indexes of dispersion. This is an interesting read on Wikipedia. If you're, if you're curious about it, you can go to the index of dispersion article, and there are links to related um, concepts. But this one it, uh, seems to work pretty well, and it's very uh, computationally easy. Um, we can actually do it in a single pass through the data. So we can get the variance and divide it by the mean, and then what we get is this normalized uh, number that uh, tells us how variable the distribution was uh, um, within each of those buckets of time. And normalized is important. There are many metrics like the standard deviation that are not normalized. They have the same units and the same magnitude as the input data, but it's nice to have something that doesn't have um, the same magnitude as the input data because that if you're looking at standard deviation across two systems that are very different, uh, let's say you've got a system that has your typical uh, response time in the microseconds, and you're looking at the standard deviation of that. You're typically going to get standard deviations in the microseconds. And then if you go to another system that has typical response times in the seconds or tens of seconds, your standard deviations there are going to be much, much larger. So it's very difficult to compare your microseconds to your seconds and understand whether one of them is intrinsically more variable than the other or not. Um, but the index of dispersion or the, the variance to mean ratio normalizes those things relative to each other and lets us compare one system to another very easily. So if we plot the same stuff, uh, 200 milliseconds at a time, we'll get these spikes. Uh, and most of the time, the index of dispersion uh, tends to hug the around zero very, very tightly. And then occasionally, we get really high spikes where there are um, highly variable periods of time. And um, if you align this with uh, the first graph that I showed you, the one with, the, uh, with all of the response times plotted on it, you'll actually see that most of these little spikes correspond to one of those long-running two-thirds of a second queries. Um, so, so if I had plotted them on top of each other, um, you would see that pretty clearly. So to, to, summar to summarize, um, variable means optimizable because if something is behaving inconsistently, it means that we might have an opportunity to make it more consistent. And we'd like definitely like things to, to always be taking the fast path through the system. It's hard to, uh, I've tried different techniques to overlay these graphs on each other, and it's basically pretty hard to do. So, so I've instead just shown them, uh, all three of them together. And in this case, you can see that uh, all three of these graphs kind of show some of the same things, but some of them show a little bit different things than others. Uh, for example, this spike lines up with um, this spike here, but um, some of these other things don't necessarily. So I have seen systems where one of these kinds of analysis will show me that something is happening, something interesting, something that's worth a little bit of effort to dig more into. Um, and this is all like, you know, 20 minutes of work here. So I didn't really spend any time or effort or money on this. And I found out a lot about, to, you know, there might be something worth digging into here. So I'm not the only one who does this. Um, Uh, one of my customers sent me, a, a, tweeted about this at one point, and, um, and then sent me his graph. The, uh, the URL to the sketch there looks like this. Uh, and he sent me an email and said, I just used this to basically beat my data center guys over the head. They had they'd moved to a new data center, and he was seeing really, really bad performance. This is at the TCP level. Um, uh, sorry, this is at the HTTP level coming into their load balancer. So he was able to take this back to the, the network operations guys and say, look, we're having extremely bad performance. You know, there are periods of time where I'm just not getting my web traffic into my load balancer at all. Something's going on. Interestingly, this turned out to be correlated to um, snapshot activity on a SAN, of all things. So there was a, a SAN that was um, the, the, uh, the infrastructure one level out from them, one, one tier out from them 
um, had a dependency on a SAN, and when they were taking snapshots on the SAN, it would actually freeze the incoming uh, TCP traffic of all things. So it was, that was kind of interesting. Took a while to dig into that. But these are at one second intervals, uh, and you can see, you know, when we are doing our, our arrivals minus completions uh, mathematics here, we're looking at one or two second intervals where we're getting many, many thousands of packets that are getting blocked and then flushing through the system. So it was, it was pretty, um, it was very difficult for them to argue with this, this evidence, even though they had argued about everything else and said it couldn't possibly be that, you know, your systems are the problem, not ours. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to have um, tools like this. So that concludes um, black box performance analysis part one, and then I want to move on to the analysis of scalability and performance. So the first thing I want to do is, is talk a little bit um, clearly about scalability. I would say formally, but I don't want to be overly formal about this. Um, I, don't, I just don't want us to say something ambiguous about scalability and not be talking about the same thing. So my definition of scalability comes from Dr. Neil Gunther. Um, and uh, it took me a long time before I actually realized what he was talking about. He said scalability is a function. And I heard him say and write that I don't know how many times before I started to understand. When he says function, he means equation. He's not talking about, you know, when I say, I don't know, my water intake is a function of how fast I run or something. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, I had some sort of loosey-goosey thing in my mind and the light bulb clicked one day and I realized he was talking about an equation, a mathematical function. And the x-axis is, um, the x-axis can, you can define scalability in a few different ways, but um, uh, what I'm going to do is, is group them together and say that the x-axis represents the worker units on the system. You can also use it as the, um, uh, the work capacity of the system. And then the y-axis is throughput. So if we draw this in a graph, uh, what we have is throughput going up and down, and uh, we've got some system that at a, at, a, uh, um, at a level of one worker unit in the system, like we can call it one thread, one user, one whatever, one session, whatever that is, um, we have a certain amount of scalability. And um, the scalability function uh, starts at the origin and goes through that point. And this is linear scalability, where when we double what we expect of the system, uh, we get an exactly proportional return back. So another way to think about this, linear scalability is a, an, equal return on investment is one of the phrases that I've heard used, or equal bang for the buck, or something like that. Linear scalability means that all of those points on the graph, all of the throughput versus capacity or, or work on the system, they line up and they exactly, and then and they line up exactly with the origin. So um, at Velocity Conference a while back, a um, couple of months back, not, not the conference itself, but something called Velocity Summit, we were talking about this and um, a few of us felt the need to put up a context called a, 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 a website called contextneeded.com sort of formed a meme around this and we put up an explanation of what is sometimes claimed to be linear scalability but is not linear scalability at all so if you're curious um, I and some others have sort of uh, dug deeply into some uh, volt DB benchmark and shown how it seems to be scalable uh, linearly scalable but it's actually not which is sort of a little bit sad because VoltDB is actually a very scalable system. It's just it, when you make a claim about linearity that's not really there, um, it kind of, uh, it's a little bit of a shame because you could have said highly scalable instead of linearly scalable. So this is linear scalability. Everything is on an exactly straight line that comes out of the origin. This is uh, another kind of linear scalability. It's just a uh, different slope of the line. This represents a difference in performance, not scalability. Okay, so this is kind of uh, one of those concepts that's important, I think, to, to understand clearly, is that a system can be very high performance and uh, not scalable, or it can be extremely scalable, uh, but not particularly high performance when you consider uh, the uh, performance of a single node. This is not linearly scalable. Those two uh, points are in a line. All, all, all two points can be connected by a straight line, but it doesn't go through the origin. Right, so typical systems tend to look like this. They tend to drop off from purely linear scalability as you, as you increase the throughput or the, the um, I'm sorry, as you increase the load on the system. And there are two reasons for this um, that Dr. Gunther elaborates in his books. There may be other reasons for this, but here are two that are very easy to understand and very useful in the real world. 
And the first one is that the system might have a, a, a serialization point where all of the work can continue in parallel, but occasionally there's a, a point of global serialization where all of these guys have to stop and work proceeds single-threadedly and then it can be uh, proceed in, uh, um, parallel again. And um, Andal's law says we can, no matter how massively we parallelize the blue bars, we can never reduce the amount of time that this task is going to take to a shorter uh, duration than the, the width of that yellow bar where time is flowing from left to right. If we write Amdahl's law um, as an equation down here on the bottom, the capacity of n workers is equal to n over 1 plus sigma times n minus 1. And sigma is a coefficient of, of uh, serialization here. Sigma is the fraction of the work that has to be done in serial and cannot be parallelized. So um, ideally, we would like our systems to be embarrassingly parallelable, parallelizable, uh, where everything can be done in parallel and there's, uh, there's no point of serialization. But in reality, most systems have some kind of a serialization. If you think about a MapReduce job, for example, um, there's one job that gets split into many and then operated on in parallel and the, the results are then combined back together again. But actually, the splitting the job up um, is a serialized portion, and putting things back together is a serialized portion. So those are the kinds of things that can prevent things from scaling linearly. The second factor is called crosstalk, or um, it can be called coherency, or uh, there are various other words for it. But I use the word crosstalk because I think it illustrates what's going on pretty well. So let's assume now that our MapReduce job is running things in parallel, but occasionally they have to check in with each other and make sure that they've got um, uh, the same data as somebody else, for example. <clears throat> and this, uh, this communication in between these parallel workers uh, introduces the other degradation from linearity, which I've added in the equation on the bottom um, with the, uh, uh, the coefficient kappa in front of it. So there's a portion of the work that has to be serialized, a portion of the work that requires crosstalk or, or coherency checking to happen, and the combination of those things together creates um, the, the equation on the bottom, which is the universal scalability law. That's, that's Dr. Gunther's invention, the universal scalability law. And if you'll notice, the, um, the, the equation in the red box is actually on squared. So this actually, the, the cost of crosstalk grows um, quadratically with re uh, respect to the number of workers or the number of uh, worker units in the system. So as we add more and more and more work to the system, or we add, let's say, more and more and more CPUs to our system, um, what we can see is that eventually uh, the, um, the coherency or crosstalk portion of the workload begins to grow faster, and we will get retrograde scalability, which I'll il illustrate on the next slide. So linear scalability is that diagonal line. Amdahl's law is the blue line, uh, sorry, is the red line that eventually approaches an as asymptote. The asymptote is one over, it, it's the reciprocal of that serial portion. So if, thank you, if the, um, if the serial portion of the workload is uh, 10%, then the asymptote that Amdahl's law approaches is going to be 10. Um, and the universal scalability law does what real systems do. It peaks and then it drops off and we start to get less uh, throughput from the system as we increase the work or the demands on the system. So uh, the universal scalability law models how we know real systems tend to behave um, in real life. So uh, this, is, uh, this, this is the basis for forecasting and, and modeling how a system can scale over time. So what we do, uh, uh, we're going to get back to this TCP data again after kind of going through this theory. What we can do is we can measure the throughput and the concurrency and uh, perform a regression. Your spreadsheet can't do this, but tools like R or um, GNU plot can actually do this for you. Um, perform a regression against the universal scalability law and figure out what the, what the coefficients of those, um, uh, what the values of those coefficients, kappa and sigma, sigma are. And then with a little bit of insight, we can actually uh, uh, get some, um, something useful out of this. So we need throughput, right? That's easy. We get that just by counting queries per second. Concurrency is a little harder. There are several different ways to do it, but one of the ways that I've done it is implemented in PTTCP model. And I've got a, a diagram that shows this a little bit more clearly. Time flows from left to right here. And um, some query arrives at t equals 0. Query 1 arrives at t equals 0 and runs to t equals 4, where it completes. 
In the meantime, at t equals 3, query 2 arrives and then runs all the way up to, to time equals 7 and then completes. And if we add up the area under the square here, we'll get the average concurrency of, uh, experienced by the system during this time. Um, so we have the observation time of 7, which is just the beginning and the end subtracted. And the total query time is 8, and so our average concurrency is just a little bit over 1. It's 8 sevenths. So PTTCB model knows how to compute this, and you can slice up um, the uh, original file and uh, slice it into little uh, time buckets and um, uh, output it into, into this file called sliced.txt, which has a whole bunch of fields into it that I won't go into. There's all of those things like the variance to mean ratio and the uh, response time deviations and um, percentiles and stuff. But what we're most interested in for the purposes of this analysis is the throughput during each of those, uh, uh, throughput and concurrency during each of those time intervals. And then I apply um, R or GNU plot. I've, I've written a little set of tools around GNU plot, so that's what I typically tend to do. And we get those coefficients out the other end. And um, so this is the same data set. Uh, and on the left, we've got these little green dots. Those are the throughput and concurrency measurements. We've got the red line. Um, which represents the equation that I've derived after figuring out the coefficients, and I've just plotted them on top of the points, so you can kind of see how the points and the, and the plot fit together. I've also printed on here the um, coefficient of, I think this is the coefficient of determinant, but I can't quite remember what the name for it is, but um, the R squared value, uh, even though I've forgotten the name for it, is a, a measure of how closely those points fit to the line. And in this case, we've got over 98%, which is usually considered very good. I like for things to be even much better than that, um, but uh, in this case, that's what we get. So we see that apparently um, just under 15% of the workload is serialized, and a very small percentage uh, requires crosstalk in this case. But even with that very small crosstalk, we do reach a, a, a rolling off point, and the, the graph starts to drop. And then if I plot the rest of the points, we see the, the, uh, at the higher concurrencies, we actually get worse performance than expected, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Yeah. So sigma is the coefficient of serialization. Sigma is 0.14, so that's a little bit less than 15%. And that may or may not be true, but that's what the model kind of spits out. Right? So. Uh, so the way that I approach the universal scalability law is as a model. Um, it's imperfect. But you can use it for an uppercase bound or a lowercase bound on your systems. And I'll explain that a little bit. So as a, as a worst case bound, the, the USL model itself, uh, the, the mathematical model actually maps to a particular type of queuing called synchronous repairman queuing, which is worst case queuing for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, and your system really ought to scale better than that. So you can use the USL as a point of reference for, is my system as scalable as it ought to be? Because otherwise, I mean, how would you have any idea of whether your system is performing as well as it ought to or not, right? Um, you, you, without some sort of frame of reference, you don't have anything to discuss, and the USL gives you that. If you use it as a best case bound, um, you can consider that most systems scale worse than they're supposed to. And uh, so for capacity planning purposes, you can say, I'm not going to count on any more than this. Um, so, so for bottleneck analysis, you say, I want to do better than this. For capacity planning purposes, you say, I'm not going to count on it, right? And remember that the USL is just a model, um, and models, you know, all models are, some models are useful, all models are wrong. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this, the serialization and the crosstalk are models of why systems might fail to scale but they're not necessarily the exact answer and the exact um, model of your particular system, although it is very powerful. We can flip this over and use Little's Law uh, to actually model response time as well as scalability. So uh, the, the formula is very simple. The, the relationship between um, throughput, response time, and concurrency is, is written up here on the board. And I have done uh, a plot of this and a, um, thanks, and a, um, uh, a model of the forecasted response time as well. So now we can see that uh, our forecasted response time, um, you know, we can, we can start to understand when we might be violating our SLAs, for example. So the USL works best on a uniform workload. This, you know, this, this workload we saw is not uniform. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to apply the USL to this. Uh, a highly mixed or changing workload is even harder. 
and there are workloads that I've found that it's difficult to apply this to. Um, and as we saw, we had limited success because the USL predicted that we were going to peak out at a certain point, and we saw that when we actually reached those higher concurrencies, we failed to, to actually achieve that. Um, so we, we scaled indeed worse than the, than the model predicted. So just be aware of that. Um, also be aware of some of the technicalities of how you capture your data. Make sure that you're uh, it, basically garbage in, garbage out. Make sure that your data is, is clean on the way in. And do that time series plotting first and look for periods of your data where something is clearly wrong. Um, and you may need to excise those portions or to throw out outliers or something like that. If I had thrown out the, the outliers, um, for example, the spikes on that graph, we might have gotten a really beautiful fit to that curve. Uh, so, th so that's something interesting to do. And here are some of the resources. The white paper uh, is on About Us, my SQL white papers, and there's actually a couple white papers that are related to this. One of them um, takes Neil Gunther's book, which is admittedly very dense, um, and often, sometimes, uh, I know it took me a while, it took me three or four readings to kind of figure out, okay, so how do I actually apply this? And you sort of read back through it, and in hindsight, it's obvious. But um, uh, for those of you who might have the same reaction that I did, um, I certainly encourage reading his book. It has a lot of details that I'm not going over here. But the, uh, the first white paper mentioned up here, uh, or actually the second one, Forecasting MySQL Scalability, breaks down the math and fills in some of the missing pieces where he jumps from one equation to another without showing all the steps in the algebra. Um, so, so hopefully those are useful resources to you. And of course the tools are all, uh, um, all of the tools that I've used are free and open source, whether it's TCP dump, uh, canoe plot, or um, the Percona toolkit tools themselves. And again, this uh, white paper, MySQL performance analysis white paper has a link where you can download the, the sample data that I used for the first half of this presentation. Um, I didn't, uh, I need to write another white paper with another sample of data for the second half. Uh, but I'll, I'll probably do that at some point in the future. So I think I'm basically right on time. I'm not sure how much time I have for questions, um, but I'm certainly happy to answer. Yeah, I've got two minutes. Um, but I'm certainly happy to answer questions. And my contact information, I'm always delighted to hear from you. Yes, sir? So the question is basically what kind of assumptions does a universal scalability model make? And um, it turns out that it makes very few assumptions. It is based on some of these things that are independent of things like the arrival, uh, the, the distribution of arrivals, or the response time distribution, some of those kinds of things. Um, one of the reasons why I like this model is that it's so much easier to use than um, Erlang queuing, for example, which has really, really rigid constraints on whether you can apply the model to a particular set of data or not. Those are often difficult constraints to uh, verify, and a lot of systems don't actually meet them. So you've got these, these models of queuing, which are useful for, for very specific things, but then you find out that it can't help you with your system. As well, the, mod the, the math in those things is extremely difficult compared to this relatively simple equation with two coefficients. So um, I think I've answered your question, but right. if not, <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, is basically, uh, let me back up my slides a little bit. Might be easier to talk about that way. So um, we can see that this, uh, this system actually scaled much worse than the low concurrency samples predicted that it would. Um, and the, the question is, if we have a good R squared fit, I think I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. If we have a good R squared fit on the lower concurrency measurements, how far out should we be confident about? How far out above what we can observe should we be confident? Right. 
fact is typically how far are you able to project with high confidence? So in practice, how far am I able to project with high confidence? This is where I say worst case bounds uh, versus best case bounds. Um, so I will typically, this is not the only thing that I will factor into trying to understand whether I think a system is going to scale to meet Christmas load uh, or whatever it is, whatever, yes, got it. Um, whatever other um, incident that I'm trying to, to forecast. Um, I'll take into account other factors such as how many CPUs are on the system, for example. Um, I know that a system is not going to achieve more, uh, more concurrency than the number of CPUs that it has to support. Typically, uh, an operation that's on the CPU and an operation that's waiting on I.O. at the same time, for example. So if I have an eight-core system, I might expect things to start to degrade around 12 or, or 16, depending on the workload. If it's a highly CPU-bound workload, I probably won't get past eight. So I'll also factor those other kinds of things into it. Uh, but in purely in terms of looking at this line and saying how much further out should I trust the red line, I don't trust it a whole lot. Um, but when I see really clean, beautiful results, uh, much cleaner and more beautiful than this, then I th I'm much more confident about things uh, a little bit further out beyond the boundaries. I don't know of any uh, mathematical way to say, oh, we can trust this out to concurrency of twice as much as we have observed or something like that. Uh, there may be a way to do that. There may be a way to have a mathematical amount of confidence in that, but I'm not aware of it. So there are definitely limitations to this, uh, to this model and this framework. So I've been, I've been shown the sign that I'm over time. <laughs> um, so I'll uh, take my mic off and uh, uh, talk with you all in the hallways. Thanks, Glenn.